Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to All Things Avenia. My name's Eli Travers. Thanks so much for being here, actually, on our last All Things Avenia show um, for the time being. I'll say it that way because. Uh, we'll definitely be able to see some, I see some opportunities coming up maybe this summer here and there, but later on in the fall um, to come back and do some special things. Um, but we've been going for, this is our 19th week in a row, so I think it's time to to put this away for a while and enjoy the summer. So I thought one of the best ways to cheers us into the summer was to talk about rosé, about rosé wine, and maybe a little bit of the history of it, how it's made, where you can find rosé from all over the world, and... Uh, and we'll just, we'll go from there. So one of the first things I'm going to do is share my screen because I have a little presentation for you. And then we'll be able to talk. Um, I'll answer any questions you have about Rosé um, and just sort of chat in general. So let me share my screen. So it's Rosé Day. I didn't really have a better title for it other than Rosé Day. I mean, all day Rosé. There's lots of ways you can say it. A lot of the younger generations probably have hipper ways to say it. But I'm just happy to call this Rosé Day. Uh, it's May 27th, time to drink rosé. Um, but let's talk a little bit, we'll reverse and think about where did it all come from. You know I love history, so here we go. So rosé is actually, what's interesting is the very first wine was basically a rosé style wine. It was a pale colored wine. And the reason was because before they knew more modern winemaking techniques of maceration and extracting more tannins and colors from the grape skins, they would basically pick the grapes from the vineyard they press it, and so red grapes press it into juice, and that juice was pink or pale colored because it didn't have enough time to extract color, and they'd make wine from it, and then they would enjoy that, and that was their wine, hooray. Um, they actually, when a wine, when the grapes would soak in the juice a little longer to give it more color or to give it more tannin and structure, that was often considered poorer wine or because it was too harsh, it was too bitter. Although these were the same people who were adding, you know, pine resin and, and spices and honey and herbs to their wine to make them last a long time. So who, who knows what the, the tastes of the ancient Greeks and Romans were like. But you can assume that the very first styles of rosé were actually rosé or pink colored wines. And this stayed in popularity all the way through to the Middle Ages. Um, by the time the English sort of joined with, with uh, France, this was the mid 12th century when the Eleanor of Aquitaine married Henry II and now Bordeaux was part of the English realm. Um, the English started looking for more rosé or red style wines because for a long time white wines dominated northern Europe. And so Bordeaux had made, been making this pale red color wine and they called in the English called it claret, um, sort of after this clear uh, reddish wine. And claret would remain very attached to the English way of life for a long time, all the way until the 20th century. Um, and that usually they actually had a name for it in France called a vin de nuit, or a, a, a wine of one night, because they usually left the skins to macerate for one night or overnight. And that's how it got its, its pink color. And so, so that style became a little more popular as, as the British um, took hold of it and spread it and, and celebrated that. Um, and then by the 17th, 16th and 17th century in Champagne, this is when uh, you had uh, Dom Perignon and some of the other monks and people making wine, and they figured out how to make white wine from red grapes, so that Blanc de Noir style. Um, and part of that was that it still, because they were just direct pressing those grapes, you'd get a little pinkish color. Um, so they termed the, the, or they coined the term Eau de Pedri, which means the eye of the partridge, um, because it's the color of the wine sort of mimicked that reddish color around the eye of a partridge. I think as it was about to die. There's, I still was looking that up. I was like, is it really in the throes of death? Apparently. Um, but that Eau de Pedri term stuck. Um, they don't really use it as much in Champagne. It's actually now his protected name in Switzerland, where they do make rosé styles in Switzerland under that Eau de Pedri uh, term. By the 19th century, you had all the, the French tourists who would go to the Côte d'Azur and vacation in Provence in the south of France on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and this is where, you know, Marseille and, and in Provence is where winemaking started in France. That was one of the first colonies, Roman colonies of, of the France, of the French region um, that was making wine. So rosé had sort of lasted there for a long time. But really in the 19th century is when people started associating it with glamour, with leisure, with summertime. They would go on vacation and have these beautiful rosés um, while they were eating, you know, sardines and playing pétanque. Just a beautiful, beautiful picture. 
And then the Americans had to do something. So, well, not all Americans, because we, we do lots of great things. But by the 20th century, at the end of World War II, we had um, this, uh, many wine regions were assuming, rightfully so, that there'd be a demand for wine after the war ended. So in Portugal, these two families created these wines, uh, Matus and Lancers, which some of you might recognize, that bottle on the right, that Matus bottle. Um, I didn't have a picture of the Lancers, but, um, but these were, were basically slightly fizzy, semi-sweet rosé, and they were pretty cheap, but it led to record sales. Around this time, this was still close enough to, to prohibition or post-prohibition in America where, where there was such a, a taste for sweeter wines that um, they really took off and, and um, people wanted that sweeter style wine. And so sales just boomed. But at the same time, after a while, people started realizing these were cheap rosés. If you didn't like it, you were very much turned off from it. And so this style rosé became, um, it was almost stigmatized. And it was, everyone just assumed that rosé was bad because Matus and Lancers were bad, quote unquote bad. Um, and it's funny actually that Matus, there was a huge ad campaign because as sales started to dip because of this impression that all rosé was bad, uh, Matus had Jimi Hendrix and Queen Elizabeth help with the advertising campaign to get more people to drink it. Um, and I actually found, we'll just watch this real quick because I found a pretty hilarious commercial. Obviously for those watching this on YouTube, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> to not include this for copyright reasons, but for those of you live, you get this little treat. So anyway, I just had, I felt like I had to share that because advertising is, is amazing. So, so Matus, you know, and Lancers, that, that style still remained popular. Like the, the ads worked, sales started to come back up. And then around the same time, so mid seventies, you had Americans, in, in, especially in California, this is when the wine industry in California was starting to take off and they wanted to have a way to compete with some of the other rosé wines and that were, were popular. Um, but a couple different, you know, hallmark things happened. And one of them was at Sutter Home. So this is in Napa. Um, Bob Trincaro, the, the winemaker at Sutter Home, um, for a few years, he had been trying to concentrate his Zinfandel, so his red wine Zinfandel, by bleeding off some of the juice, or Senye, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and so what he did with that juice, because it was this pale pinkish color, he's like, well, let's make this into wine. And he would make, he would ferment it, and it was a dry, whitish pink wine. And so um, around the same time as also there was a demand for white, more white wines and almost more white wines than were available in the States. So it was kind of sort of a combination of happenstance from Senye and then all of a sudden something happened and a demand for more lighter white and pink colored wines. Um, but in, in 1975, he had one of his white Zinfandels, this, this little side project from his Zinfandel production um, that had a stuck fermentation. And what that means is that during fermentation, when the sugars are being consumed by the yeast and produced into alcohol, um, the yeast all of a sudden died or just stopped working. This happens every once in a while. And so what was left was this pink wine that had a little bit of residual sugar. And he sort of sat on it for a couple of weeks and just decided, you know what, I guess I'll still try to sell this wine. Maybe people will like it. And it just took off and boomed and white Zimbabwe became a thing. And it, and it quickly rose to be one of the top selling wines in the, in the country. That uh, so around the same time, the next year actually, at Mill Creek Vineyards in Sonoma, um, the winemaker there had produced, um, had also tried producing a white wine from a red grape. And you saw this all over the place. They had white Merlots. This guy had made a white Cabernet. But the color of this was a little darker and he, was, he didn't really want to call it white Cabernet because it wasn't white. It was still a pretty dark shade of, of rosé color. So there was actually a wine writer visiting from LA. He's like, oh, you know, it's kind of like blush or maybe it's like Cabernet blush. And they kind of laughed it off. Well, they thought about it more and then they realized, you know what, Blush might be a good name for this style of, of wine. So that name, Blush, stuck. And for a long time, Blush became the category of wine or the, the term for American rosé or American pink wine. Um, but usually those were still sort of semi-sweet wines. Um, around this time, you know, on the other, the flip side of this is that you also started seeing importers, smaller importers, including Kermit Lynch in Berkeley, California, who were importing dry rosé into the country. And it really would take the next 30, you know, 25, 30 years to catch on for people to 
sort of turn away from the sweeter styles and embrace those drier styles of rosé that we find uh, in France and other parts of the world. So then 21st century arrives and all of a sudden rosé starts taking off. Um, we, they just immense growth throughout the early 2000s. I think 2008 is when you had Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie purchase Chateau Miraval and make their, their rosé there. And having that extra celebrity push behind it kind of helped raise the profile of, of rosé. You also had the invention of Instagram and other social networks where you had, um, it was easier to engage a wider um, array of people. You had your hashtags, rosé all day, yes way rosé, that sort of took off and rosé became hip again, it became trendy. Um, and one sort of spark, and it, when doing research for this, it's kind of hard to find actual evidence and in, in, in clear data, but one of the events that a lot of people think really helped spark the, the takeoff of rosé was there was articles in 2014 that the Hamptons had run out of rosé or were running out of rosé for the first time. Or it might have happened in 2012 too, but but the, in 2014 was when people started taking notice. And, oh no, the Hamptons don't, don't have rosé. We got to get more rosé in this country. So by 2015, the next year, sales just skyrocket. And at this point, it's been doing that for, for the previous decade. By 2018, Provence um, is selling 2 million cases of rosé to the U.S. alone, which was up tremendously from 2010. Um, obviously last year we had COVID-19 hits, which, which did weird things to, to wine sales because there was sort of a, a boom and a little bust at different uh, times of the year. But Rosé kept climbing. Um, and they do project that Rosé sales will continue to grow another 70%. And that's from Drizzly, an alcohol delivery app that's actually great for sort of tracking some of these consumer habits. So that's where we're at now. Rosé is, is, is really, hip it's really great and it is also made everywhere i was thinking about you know where to, to say like oh this is where great rosé has grown and i got a little carried away as you can see but we'll, we'll just quickly go through where you can find some really fun awesome rosé around the world and you can see this is only european rosé it literally is made everywhere you can find awesome malbec rosé from argentina there's great rosés out of chile south africa australia new zealand obviously all over canada and us um but some of the ones, if you're looking for some of those old world styles, these are some things to look for. Obviously, Provence, um, which is sort of the, the, the grandmother of all rosé, we can call it. Um, that's where beautiful dry styles of rosé are from, including Bandol and, um, and Palette and, and Cote de Provence and a lot of different regions within there. Uh, in Southern Rhone, you have Tavel. It's actually one of the only um, Appalachians entirely devoted to rosé. So Tavel, if you see those that word on, on a, a bottle, it has to, by law, be a rosé wine. And these are dry. It's usually a darker color made from Grenache, Senso, sometimes Syrah and Merved. Um, but it actually can age a couple years, so it's not one of those wines you have to drink right away, um, but just some beautiful wines. Um, one of my personal favorite styles of rosé is, is called Van Gris, and we'll talk about that style a little bit later. Um, but um, it's popular in Cote de Toul, which is a small appellation in Lorraine, if you know of Alsace-Lorraine, so northeastern France. Um, in Burgundy, you have some really beautiful rosés from Marcinet in the northern part of the Cote d'Or. Some beautiful ones in the Loire Valley, both from Anjou, maybe, uh, more Cab Franc dominated rosés, and then Sancerre with, with Pinot Noir rosés. Champagne, the Champagne region actually has its own um, appellation for rosé called rosé de Rissi, and that's from the southern part of Champagne, basically Pinot Noir style rosés as well. Um, and then beautiful rosés from Corsica too, so the island in the Mediterranean. Um, you know I love Italy, so Italian rosés, I think you should definitely search out um, in Abruzzo, so this is the, the eastern side of Italy, sort of halfway down, is Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo. So Cerasuolo is the Italian word for cherry color or cherry-like. Um, and it is really beautiful, bright cherry colored rosé made from Montepulciano grapes. Um, in Veneto, I, I might have mentioned this last week, but Bardolino is a style of, of or is an appellation near Lake Garda, so near Verona, um, that makes beautiful um, rosés from Rondinella and Corvino, uh, Corvina, some of those grapes used in Amarone production. And then Sicily, that, that Norella Mascalese rosé I talked about last week as well from the slopes of Etna is just gorgeous. Of course, in Spain, you also have Rosado. Um, we talked about Chocoli, Chocoli Rosé, beautiful seaside um, rosé in, in the Basque country in northern Spain. And then Rioja and Navarra also have beautiful rosés from 
Grenache and some other Tempranillo and other grapes. Rioja particularly can age as well. So like Tavel, Rioja rosés are known to be able to age a little bit longer and you can lay them down a little bit if you don't want to drink them right away. Uh, Portuguese uh, wine. So since the Matus and Lancers saga of, of yesteryear, uh, they're still now making some beautiful rosés from Bairrada and, and Douro. Um, and uh, so definitely keep, keep an eye out for them. Sometimes they'll say rosé on the label or rosado. Uh, and then I actually really enjoy uh, Pinot Noir or Spätburgunder um, rosés from Germany, from Nahe, from Pfalz uh, and Rheinhessen. So these are just some of the places you can find some beautiful rosés from Europe. Um, but again, it is grown just absolutely everywhere. So how's it made? Um, the basic thing to know about rosé is the whole point is that you're trying to make a white wine or a white style wine from red grapes. Um, I guess if you think about the opposite, if you try to make, if you make a red wine style from white grapes, that's how we get orange wine. If you see orange wine or amber wine, um, that's kind of the flip process. But look, but rosé, the whole idea is that we want to try to get a fresh sort of light colored uh, wine from from red grapes. And there's four main methods of doing this. Sometimes you'll see people say there's three methods, two methods. I think there's more like four and I'll sort of break it out for you so um, so you can see what I'm talking about. There's direct press, short maceration, sangue, and blending. The first three are all connected, um, but you'll see why. So direct press method. So this is when you harvest the grape clusters and then they're immediately put into a press. This is a picture of Pinot Noir bunches or clusters put into a, a press that's instantly going to be pressed out and the juice um, will fall into a pan and then be racked into a vat to start fermentation. Um, because it'll have some contact with skins, you can't avoid the, the little bit of contact you'll get from those grape skins as they're pressed. It will have a, a very light hue from some of that color. Um, and because it's done so quickly, because you're getting the grapes pressing it immediately and putting it into a vat where you can control temperature, it helps preserve that freshness and aroma. Um, this is that Van Gris style. So Van Gris, um, which is, you know, from Cote de Toul, it's usually done with Gamay Noir there, but it can also be done with Pinot Noir, Grenache, other thin skin grapes. Um, this is, this is how that's done. So it's just like white wine production, if we made Sauvignon Blanc, you know, we bring in Sauvignon Blanc clusters, put it in the press immediately, press it, you want to remove the juice from the skins because you don't want any of the phenolics, um, and then you just ferment the juice as white wine. We're basically just switching the grapes, same process. Um, and then these are, you, Van Gris at least, is usually fermented in stainless steel because these grapes like Gamay and Pinot are so delicate. You don't want oak or anything to, to impact that flavor or to strip away any of that um, flavor. So that's direct press. Then we have short maceration. <clears throat> so again, red grapes are harvested, but this time um, they're destemmed, they're crushed, and then they're left to soak in a vat for anywhere from two to 20 hours, or sometimes a couple days, depending on the region, the style in which grapes you're using. This results in a little more pigment, so more anthocyanins soak into that juice, more phenolics and structures, more flavor. Um, and again, it's super important to keep things at low temperatures during this time. And this is why it's a pretty tricky process that rosé involves, you know, either you're, you make sure you're harvesting in the middle of the night or very early morning to keep that cool, that cold fruit really cold. You're transporting it on refrigerated trucks to make sure that it still preserves that freshness and you work with it pretty quickly and you make those decisions quickly. You can see in this picture that juice sort of rises to the top. It has a pinkish hue, but they might decide, you know what, let's wait a little bit longer, get a little more extraction, a little more maceration for a darker color. Because you might decide, okay, I want to have a certain color of rosé because I'm after this style or, or, you know, there's all these studies about the color of rosé and how consumers interact with it and, and react to it and what they want to buy. So that might be part of your decision process. Um, but one thing to point out, both the <coughs> maceration and the direct press, one of the reasons why some winemakers, especially in Provence, that do mainly these styles of rosé production, they think that this is the, the better way of doing rosé because the grapes are grown and picked with the intention of making rosé. So what that means is you you're might be harvesting these grapes earlier at lower sugar levels, at higher acidity levels, so that you have a resulting wine that's lower in alcohol and higher in acidity. And, and that's as opposed to picking grapes for red wine production, where you want sweeter grapes, more ripeness, and um, where you have more booze, and then bleeding off or saignéing off 
some of that juice to make rosé. So this is where we get to that third style of making rosé, or the sangye method. Um, it comes from the French word for bleed or to bleed, sangye, and it's you're basically bleeding off juice from red grape must or red grape red wine production in order to concentrate that red wine. And this is what you know Bob Trinkero was doing at Sutter Home with his Zinfandel. He wanted to make a more concentrated uh, Zinfandel, and so he bled off or saignéed some of that juice right away. So whether that's on the crush pad or after you get it into the fermentation vat, you can you can suck out some of that juice and separate it. And the less juice liquid you have, to the more skin and grape ratio, you're going to have more pigments, more tannin, more structure. And that's how you concentrate your red wines. Um, and this is this is where, you know, some people, Provence especially, they consider this to, it's not as highly regarded because it's almost a byproduct of red wine production. So in this case, you're picking your grapes to make red wine, like we said before, but then bleeding off um, some juice and then trying to make a profit off of that juice. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with this um, because it can still make delicious wines. And there's some beautiful Sanye method um, um, rosés grown all over the world, in, in, also in parts of France. And I'm sure there's places in Provence that do it. So um, a lot of places will do blending, will do a, a combination of these styles to make the rosé. So that's, that's Sanye method. And then last but not least, you have blending. It's kind of the most obvious, or if you ever, you know, if you were in college and you thought, oh, I'm going to make rosé wine and just put red and white wine together, they do that. I mean, that's actually something that people do. So this is when you blend a small amount of red wine in with finished white wine, usually in that 5% uh, range, depending on what color you want, um, to make a rosé style wine or rosé colored wine. Um, this method is actually not very common in, in quality wine. It's more common in table wine and, and sort of just generic cheaper wine all over the world. Um, but it's still used in sparkling. So in 2009, the EU tried to actually change the rules to allow for blending um, to get more rosé. Um, and But there was all these producers in Italy and France who were protesting it because they said it was there'd be just too much bad wine made from blended uh, rosé that would compete with the, their direct press method or their, their maceration method, which takes a lot more talent and skill. Um, and so by 2011, they, they tossed that out. It was no longer going to be allowed for these higher quality wines, but they kept a couple um, designations that could still legally do it. So sparkling wine was one of them. And this is something I'm, I need to do a little more research because um, in France, at least, Champagne is, the I think, the only region that can blend to make rosé before they put the bubbles in, you know, before the secondary fermentation. I don't think the Cremants, like Cremant de Bourgogne and Cremant de Loire, that they can do that as well. Um, but I'll, I'll double check. Um, but I think throughout the EU, so other countries in Europe, they can, they can still do blending for their rosé in order to make sparkling rosé. There's also, you know, some outliers like uh, Cvicic from Slovenia that's, that was sort of grandfathered in. That's a red and white blended rosé that they can still allow under EU rules. Um, it's definitely more common in the New World. So again, the United States, Australia, and a lot of South African rosé is made this way. But that's basically, um, that's basically your, your four methods of, of rosé production. So this is basically, this is the end of the road. Now, this is just sort of as like, well, obviously, I'll still answer questions about rosé, but this is also the very last one of this All Things of Venia season. So this is my thank you, you know, to all of you who are always here every week or people that have come and gone uh, or watching on YouTube. I really appreciate all of you being part of this. Um, we've done a lot of stuff. It's literally been 19 weeks of different classes. I've had some really awesome guests along, including my bosses, Chris Peterson and Marty Tucker, Chris Horn, Erica Orr, Lacey Liebeck, some awesome interviews. And basically just keep track of social media or the Avenia email list because we'll, when things come back, we'll let you know when uh, more of these kind of um, episodes or these virtual series are going to happen again. So that is that. That is Rosé slash, you know, all things Avenia all the way until now. So um, at this point, I've been talking for a long time and the Rosé has just been sitting here. So I would love if anyone had questions about rosé, about honestly, just really about anything, any even if it's stuff we talked about last week or weeks before, um, I'd be happy to answer questions now. Yeah, Logan, 
We had a question about crushing grapes. Do uh, I don't know what kind of PSI they use to uh, crush grapes. Do you crush grapes for making red wine uh, with a higher pressure than than you would for rosé? I mean, how hard do you really try and get all the juice out of a grape? That's a good question, and I, I I'll definitely have to look up. So, for instance, at our in our facility, we have a, a pneumatic bladder press. So it's a huge barrel, and and then you pro you can program what what kind of pressure you want and how long and how many cycles because it'll it'll basically have a bladder that presses inside um and then it'll retract and then tumble a little bit and then press again and then retract and tumble so a lot of those things can be programmed um i'm not sure exactly sort of if what the actual numbers are i do think though my assumption is that with red wines like for vengri if we're just talking rosé for a second if you were pressing white grapes and which have stems because these are full whole clusters you don't want to press too hard because then you're extracting some of those green tannins and astringent other other phenolics or other things you don't necessarily want in a wine um whereas with and it's, and then so for red grapes sorry for vengri with red grapes it might even be less because you don't want all the tannin from the skins in addition to stems but i'll have to, I'll have to double check but then when you're pressing red wine after fermentation, so with whites and vengri and certain rosé, you're pressing before you ferment. But with red wine, you you know, you know crush, destem, those grapes mix and mash and macerate in, while they're fermenting for a couple weeks, and then you press them. And I think you can do a little more pressure, more PSI or, or a higher rate then because you don't have to worry as much about stems. Um, the one thing you do have to worry about when, when you dump the... The, the wine and all the skins is pips like seeds and to make sure that none of the seeds get in there because that's another thing you don't want to press too hard and extract harsh tannins so but I'll, I'll double check that's a great question any other questions here's another question in the chat do the grapes get washed before being pressed or are there bugs pressed in too oh that's a great question we were just talking about cicadas before we started which Hopefully, you know, I, I feel for all my friends in Virginia making wine right now, but um, but let's see. So the grapes don't usually get washed. And I think, you know, part of it is that grapes, it's the same, I think it's the same logic for why we don't want rain events close to picking or close to harvest is because grapes will actually soak up some of that water and it will dilute um, the, the wine or dilute the juice you'll end up getting. And so I think if you wash grapes, there's, I think there's still a chance that they might soak up some of that water or there's just going to be extra water. Even if it doesn't soak up, there might be water just dripping off the grapes that'll add and dilute your wine. So usually they aren't washed. But are there bugs? Absolutely. So that's one thing, you know, people talk about vegan wines, uh, which is a thing. And um, a lot of times that's referring to the fining agent because there's certain animal products used as fining agents like egg whites and is in glass from sturgeon bladders. Um, and if wines don't have that, some people are like, oh, well, it's vegan because it doesn't have that. But honestly, there's so many bugs and critters that are harm that are just sacrificed in the making of wine <laughs> um, that that absolutely happens with with red wine. When you do crush and distem things and and then macerate, like do a short maceration or saigne method as opposed to direct press. Um, there's more than enough opportunity to get bugs out of there. So one of my jobs during harvest was cleaning, was hosing off the, uh, the um, equipment after crush and the amount of spiders and earwigs and little critters all over the place. It's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. <laughs> so, and a follow up. So if there's no washing, is organic important to avoid pesticides? Absolutely. And that's one of the big reasons why people are going biodynamic or organic um, is so they don't worry. But I think also a lot of times pesticides are used, if they do use them, it's at very specific times of year or different times during the growth cycle to try to limit the amount you, that would translate into the food or into the grapes themselves. Um, but that's it. but I'll, I'll look about that because I'm interested to know more about how pesticides affect the vine at different stages. Good questions. Uh, Susan, you, you had a question? Yeah, so um, how, how do you decide, is there a, is there a decision process about what is the best glass to use with a rosé, different types of rosé to pour yeah. into? So okay. um, I think in general, my my generic answer to that is always just a clean glass. <laughs> like, especially with rosé, because um, it's not necessarily uh, a high, you know, 
high value wine usually they're they're pretty affordable they're just as delicious next to a swimming pool as it is at a dinner table um and so any clean glass is good but because rosé is a white wine made from red grapes it's i think it's better to use what you would use for a white glass a white wine glass and so because you should be chilling your rosés a little bit it's not too much rosés you don't want to be too cold or else you're just going to lose all the beautiful aromatics and fruit flavor um but often if you if you see them in a tasting like if you were at a fancy dinner and they had a rosé in the lineup um it would often be in a white wine glass a couple exceptions are certain styles of rosé that might warrant having more aromatic you know spaces or I don't, I don't know like depending on the variety um if you have you know i would i could see someone arguing to put a van gris or a pinot noir rosé in a pinot noir glass that has a wider mount or a wider top so it ha has more aromatics um i've served rosé um, there's a beautiful uh, rosé from clocibon in provence um, made from the tiburon grape a very herbaceous grape but it's a it's a famous rosé um, partially because of how they make it. They actually age their rosé under floor. Uh, it's the same kind of yeast that's used in sherry production, and it and it develops into this really nutty flavor of rosé. So it's kind of different because it's herbaceous and nutty, but it's still rosé. But it's the kind of wine that has a little more structure. It's just a little bigger and richer, um, and that's the kind of wine I would want to put in a bigger glass, maybe like a, a Burgundy-style glass. So, and you know, maybe Nebbiolo Rosé, you could put that in a big glass. At, at the end of the day, it's still, I think as long as it's clean and it's easy to hold, then I think you're, I think you're good. <laughs> so, yeah, Renee. So I um, have been seeing a lot more like Rosé sparkling wines around. And I heard that like, and you know me, I like Prosecco. And I heard that it was just a, like officially approved or something or because you had mentioned the eu was doing stuff the official approval is that like political or is that how it's made or i don't know if you know very much like what yeah. why was it just approved to call like prosecco that looks rose rose or it's a great question i was actually just talking about this with a buyer i was i was talking to um because and I should have looked this up before this. This would have been one of the good things for me to, to learn before <laughs> this, this um, thing. But um, but yeah, for, so for a long time, Prosecco Rosé wasn't an official designation under the DOC rules or the DOCG laws in Italy. And just like the US or France, there's governing bodies that will uh, assign or that will um, yeah, assign appellation status so that protected um, designation of origin. In in Italy, it's um, DOC. So Prosecco is a DOC right now, at least most of it, which is Denominazione di Origine Controllata, so a controlled origin. Um, and they did just uh, um, approve Prosecco Rosé. And I had to like quickly look it up because right now is when you're starting to see them in the market, 2021. But I, I forget, and maybe someone, if someone is fact checking in real time, and wants to put it in the chat, they feel free. Um, but I believe it was like last year or the year before that they they approved it. Uh, January 2021 is when they're first allowed to be sold. So this is a very new designation uh, for, for Prosecco. They've been making rosé for a long time. They just couldn't call it Prosecco rosé. Um, and part of it is, again, a part of protecting that word or, or um, it's the same with when, when you try to protect the term champagne, you can't really use it in different parts. So I think it had something to do with that, but I'll, I'll look it up and put that in the fact check because I'm I'm interested to know exactly sort of how it all went down. It's very tasty. Oh yeah, it is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, Mark. Uh, in the 1960s, when we were drinking Lancers, it was weird because the, the bottle, you couldn't see through the bottle to see the wine. Yeah. And that was one of the only ones that I remember that had uh, a wine bottle that you couldn't see the liquid inside. Is there a reason for that? So I don't know what the reason was, but when it was first released, it was in a ceramic bottle. So it was a ceramic um, jar. And I do, when I was looking it up, I do know that it didn't last as long because it started to oxidize too quick. And so a lot of Lancers, because it was a little more porous, it wasn't as, as, as a good of an enclosure as glass bottle, that a lot of them started to oxidize and turn brown and nutty and not good. And I wonder if that also 
contributed to the overall impression of these rosés being bad wines. So they eventually did switch to glass. And I think of um, the, the final version was like a frosted glass because they still kind of wanted an opaque um, vessel. But yeah, the very first ones, like that picture, it, it was ceramic. So it was a totally different kind of bottle. But then they, they realized it wasn't going to be good for the long haul. <laughs> so, but I'm not sure what the marketing decision was to do that in the first place. Maybe, maybe it was something about it just felt old world, like it felt European and, you know, something historical, maybe. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to figure that out. It was also uh, good for putting candles on the top and melting. That's true. Isn't it that there's the, uh, well, I don't think it was Lancers, wasn't it Matus in, uh, oh, Animal yeah. House, in that movie Animal House? When they go to the professor's room and Donald, Donald Sutherland plays, and he has a candle in a, in a Matus bottle. Yeah. Chianti, so, they always did that. And yeah, and Chianti, the Fiasco Chianti also they would do candles. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. yeah. Um, any other? Oh, some. Oh, Marfa is the Chilean wine they're drinking now is labeled as organic and vegan. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, I have no doubt that it's a vegan wine and that they didn't use animal products in the wine itself. Um, but I guess it depends on your definitions of vegan, <laughs> veganism. Um, but also organic, you know, a lot of Chilean wines are moving towards or, uh, organic. Really a lot of, a lot of wine regions in general, but it's particularly in the new world, um, New Zealand, um, South Africa, you know, Oregon, California, like the, you're starting to see more and more, um, more and more organic wines. So, oh good, Pat, thank you so much. The newly official Prosecco Rosé uh, designation may be a marketing coup, but does it only live up to the hype? Yes and no. Oh, so it's a whole article. So if you're interested, go into the chat, everyone. You can find the article about that new Prosecco Rosé. Thanks, Pat. That's great. Um, and Mary Margaret, my, your New Year's Eve wine was a sparkling rosé. Is that a Prosecco sparkling rosé? Uh, it is. I sent, there's a picture that I sent, but um, nice. you have to click on it to download. It was oh, wonderful. Gosh. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, rosé is here to stay, but sparkling rosé is absolutely here to stay. So. Yeah. Yeah, Logan. Quick question. Is a vegan wine one that doesn't have any bugs? <laughs> I don't think, that's the thing. I don't think there is a wine that has no bugs. Although, did you see the story recently, the Lisa Vanderpump rosé wine that had, <laughs> so I just saw this the other day. So Lisa Vanderpump, who I think is a reality TV star, I don't follow the celebrity people, but um, there's a huge story because they found earwigs in the bottle <laughs> of her rosé. Renee, I'm assuming you know something about this because... I just, I'm just cracking up because you said Lisa Vanderpump, but I just was not prepared for you to say her name. I, didn't, like... yeah, I just read it. I have no idea who she is, but I think she's, if you're out there, Lisa, I'm sorry. I don't, you know, I'm sure you're famous to some people. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, Rosé is in the news constantly. It's a big deal, big deal. So, well, um, well, what do y'all think? Is there any other questions about Rosé? Is anyone drinking Rosé right now and, and want to say what they're, what they're enjoying or what, what kind of Rosé they're drinking? I will say, so I'm drinking the Avenia Rosé, but I will say that it's almost, it's getting close to being sold out. I checked with Allison today. We have 25 cases left for sale. That's it. So if you do want rosé, um, you can go online, you can go to the tasting room and just let us know because we, we should get you some some rosé. Oh, Oshinon rosé over, nice. So yeah, I think it's from Loire. Yep, that's a, and that should be a Cab Franc rosé. It's very good, it's very tasty. Nice. Yeah, oh, dry, yeah. dry, but you know, not acidic. Yeah, yeah. Tablas Creek, oh, the beautiful rosé from, from Paso Robles, nice. And then, oh, Susan, what was the rosé you uh, you had? Provence. Oh, yeah, Exxon Provence. So, yeah, if you ever see X-A-I-X, -X, that's one of the, the, the towns or the cities in Provence that makes beautiful, beautiful rosés. Um, Lee is, is doing Julia's Dazzle from Long Shadows. Excellent rosé, too. Cheers. Cheers to Long Shadows. They make some great wines, too. If you, if you don't know about Long Shadows, um, you should know them because they make beautiful wines. So, fun. Oh, well, I, I just love rosé. This is, this is, it's rosé day. So I feel great. And I want to cheers all of you and thanks for joining me. So, um, 
Well, with that, I guess this is going to be goodbye for now. So I want, again, thanks to everyone who has been here many, many weeks and many months. Um, all of these, again, all of the videos, all the things that I've been doing um, are available to see. You can go to our website, to our news. It's our blog page to see the different episodes. If you missed one, um, if you want to, they're on YouTube as well. Um, definitely check out the fact sheet. I'm I'm a stickler for if I'm wrong about something, I want to correct the record. So there is a lot of things in the fact check, but also some fun stuff too, like links to articles and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, if, if, if you wanted to check out some more, um, check out our website, but until, until later this year, um, thanks again. And I will hopefully see you all again soon. Sound good. Thanks, thanks so much, much Eli. Thanks, Bye. Eli. Bye. Thank you. It's been great. Happy summer. Happy, yeah, happy, happy summer. summer. It's been great. Have a beautiful next summer. Next week. All right. <laughs> have a great summer, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.